Hey guys, let us talk about atomic diagrams. <clears throat> I'm picking an example from class just because um, I really want to be able to double check that I'm showing you guys how to do this properly. Um, I could pull a circuit out of my ass and do it, but I may be showing you guys the wrong answer in the end. And I don't want to do that, so I hope that's okay for everyone. Um, this one I found was a little bit weird, so I'll be discussing this one. Um, so let's, uh, let's get to it, I guess. So in a question on an exam or something like that, um, they give you some information. Um, they'll tell you whether or not the clock is edge triggered, which is important. And we'll discuss that in a second. Um, but what you do have to figure out is if it's positive edge triggered or negative edge triggered. So the way you can tell is if the clock is inverted going in to your flip-flops or not. So here we see that the clock is not inverted, so we know that it's positive edge triggered. If it were negative edge triggered, you'd have your empty circle here sign signaling an inverted signal, I guess, coming from the clock. In a question like this, you're also going to be given um, a couple inputs. So in this specific question, you're given the pulses for X and Y. So I'm going to just draw out the clock pulses and the X and Y pulses and then we'll get to it. Alright, so this might be a lot to take in right off the bat, but this first pulse here is your clock pulse, so it's regular. It just goes boop, 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 boop. Here, I'll retrace as I make my sounds here. Boop, 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 boop. It's consistent. It's a clock, so it pulses in and out. X and Y are also given, but the thing with X and Y is that they're not bound to the clock, so they can change whenever they want. So here with X, we see that it will not change with our clock pulses. And I've labeled here, it changes up to one. So when the pulse goes up like that, when it's low down like this, it's zero. And when it shoots up like that, it's one. <coughs> so here we notice that it changes before the dotted line. So that means that X and Y here are just not bound to um, to the clock and that poses an interesting problem for us and when I say interesting it's because I've been indoctrinated into this stupid institution and now I suddenly think that complicated things are interesting anyway um, this looks like an F edge triggered that's weird anyway edge triggered so this is where that comes in edge triggered means that an action happens um, at the edge of a clock pulse. And this is why we had to figure out if it was positive edge triggered or negative edge triggered. Because if it's negative edge triggered, it will trigger on the down edge when the pulse comes down. But since our circuit here is positive edge triggered, that means that our trigger is going to happen here, where I've put the dotted lines. So I'm going to just trace in green here so as the pulse goes up with my little green arrows here we are triggering an action and this is where our pulses will come in so now for the inputs that we have to do we have to check and see what our outputs are or what changes or really just anything that we want to write down we're able to so we have Z, Z is an output as we can see, Q0 is an output, and Q1 is an output. So we're going to have pulses going for all of those. Alright, so now let's look at our Z. Where's my cursor now? There it is. If we look at our Z, we see that it relies on the multiplexer output. Now remember how multiplexers work depends on our select lines. 
So that means that when y is 0, our output will be q1. And when y is 1, our output will be x. So thankfully, we don't have to deal with q1 just yet. Because if we look at y, it's 1 for a little while. So we don't have to deal with it just yet. So let's take that out. I'm going to start with z. Um, so we notice that z is not bound by the clock because it's part of the multiplexer. And we know that y is 1 for a little while. So that means that z is just going to shadow x. It's just going to be the same as x for a little bit. Um, because as long as y is 1, then z will just be x. So we can follow x for a bit. Really, we can follow x up until y is no longer 1, which is at that point right before the fourth clock pulse there. So now we'll start on q0. q0, um, if we remember our d flip-flop truth table, I'll just draw it out here. It's also known as the transparent flip-flop because the values are just the same. So when you plug in a d, the q is the exact same as the input. So that's awfully nice for us because that means that q0 will just follow x. The bad part, or the tricky part rather, is that q is bound by a clock, so it can only change when uh, the clock pulse is going up. So at the dotted lines, that's when q0 can change. So if we look at this first dotted line here, we know that q0 will depend on x. So we look just a little bit before the dotted line, like right here or something. Right before we know that it's supposed to change, and we look at x, and that's what q will be. So that's how we know it's going to be 0 for a while. But now here, at this second clock pulse, we're looking up here, and we're saying, holy crap, right where this black arrow is, holy crap, x is becoming 1. So now q0 has to become 1, and it will stay that way for an entire clock pulse. So we don't know what's going to happen to it yet, because we're going to move on to Q1 for now. So Q1, as we can see, depends entirely on a Q0. So it will essentially follow Q0 for now. So we see that at this first clock pulse here, that Q0 is just 0. And the same thing here. So now we're going to look just a little bit before this clock pulse, and we notice that it's 0. Q1 depends on Q0, so we have to wait for Q0. So that's why we're looking at that value before the second clock pulse. So this stays 0 for now, because just before the second clock pulse, Q0 hasn't changed yet. But we notice that at the third clock pulse, it changes to 1, right here, just before. So that means that Q1 will go up for one clock pulse. So let's go back to Z here. At this fourth clock pulse, we see that Y is no longer 1. So now we have to start looking at X0 which is just q1. So now z is going to depend on q1. So now we have to look at q1 just before the clock pulse, and we have to change it accordingly. So that means for this little blip, since q1 is 1, for this little blip, we want to shoot up to 1. OK, so now we're moving on to q0, which depends on z. So now we want to look just a little bit before, oh, and it looks like we're dropping again because it's 0 right here. Okay, 
and now we can move on to uh, yeah we'll do Q0 so Q0 depends on Z just a bit before here right here so it's 1 so that means we're gonna shoot back up again Actually, I don't know if it's going to go back down just yet, so we're going to just do that straight line there. Now we're doing Q1, which depends on Q0. So we look just a little bit before the line here, and we see that it's 0, so we got to shoot back down again. And we're kind of starting to see a pattern. It looks like Q0 reflects Q1. So we're almost safe to just complete it right now, but I'm going to go through it step by step to make things a bit easier. All right, we're going back to Z, and Y is still zero, so now we have to go back and look at our Q1. Since Z doesn't depend on the clock, we look at what is happening to Q1 immediately, and we see that Q1 is dropping. So that means we have to drop as well. And we're going to drop for the entire clock pulse because Q1 is going to be zero for the entire clock pulse. The only reason why we have this little blip is because Y changed suddenly. It changed between clock pulses. And ideally, since Y is our select line, we're always looking back to Y. Okay, so Q0 depends on the Z. And so we're looking just a bit before the line again, like right here. And we see that we drop again. And then Q1 depends on Q0. And we go up. Okay, so now we're looking at Z. Z can go up immediately because it doesn't depend on the clock. Because Q1 goes up here. Z just goes up when Q1 goes up. Because now, because of Y changing, now we're only looking at Q1 for the rest of the pulse. So essentially, from now on, Z will just be equal to Q1. So now I think we're probably pretty safe to complete things here because we can just follow the pattern just like that. And then Z is mimicking Q1 so we can complete it as well. Okay, so that was like an introductory video for timing diagrams. This circuit was a little bit tricky to start, but I feel like once we got the hang of it, it was okay. So the next video, I'm going to go through it pretty quickly. It'll be kind of uh, part two, if you will. It'll be a different example, but will be a lot more complicated. So thanks for watching, and uh, feel free to subscribe and suggest ideas for new videos. And happy studying.